we lived on the Upper West Side, um, 106th and Broadway, and I had a studio up there in a, the one studio building in the neighborhood. And I, I had six months left that I could be there. Mm -hmm. So we started looking, and there wasn't anything else up there. Um, so we started looking downtown. And Michelle Stewart, who is still to this day living on the other loft in this, this floor of my building, she and her then husband were friends of ours. And she said she knew this loft would be available because she could hear the couple who lived here fighting through the walls. She knew they were breaking up and she was right. Um, we were looking around and saw a number of other places, but within six months this loft became available and, um, and we moved here. And that was 1974. Wow, early. The studio I had uptown was a nice sized studio and I was doing uh, pretty big paintings there. Mm -hmm. And then I moved downtown and this studio, which was the studio of the artist who lived here before me, um, I was a little intimidated by the size of this studio. Mm -hmm. And after a while I realized that I was working in an area the size of my former studio. Mm -hmm. I had sort of, that, that was my limit. And I, when I realized that, I, I said to myself, you, you have to expand and use this space. Mm -hmm. and you have to grow into it, and eventually, of course, I did. Mm -hmm. I see. And what kind of work did you do at the time? Um, when we moved here in 74, I was doing these pattern paintings, and they became larger, and eventually they moved off the wall and became installations. Mm -hmm. And um, I started working in ceramics. I started making tiles. I started making tile installations. I got a kiln. Um, and it was like a little cottage industry here and I had studio assistants helping me and I was firing around the clock and that was late 70s into the 80s. Mm -hmm. I see. I uh, gave it all away. About You gave it all away? What? I gave all the ceramics equipment away around the year 2000. I was through with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I gave it to Hunter College. Oh, you did? Okay. Mm -hmm. And what was the neighborhood like? It was, I'm sure other people have said the same things, but it was quiet. There weren't any uh, tourists. There weren't any, uh, there wasn't any uh, uh, very, very few businesses. Um, and almost everybody who lived here was an artist. So I, you know, now the streets are flooded with people. I don't know any of them. Uh -huh. In those days, there were very few people in the street, but you tended to know them. Um, and it was dark at night and quiet and felt safe. Mm -hmm. And if you, took, if you were out late and you took a cab home, they could never find it. <laughs> yeah. Soho was both on the rise and degenerating as we came here in 1974. On one hand, the light industries and shops, some of them sweatshops that had uh, characterized the place, were being phased out. Mm -hmm. There was a, a program called AIR, mm -hmm. Artists in Residence, which established the possibility of artists renting cheap, large, well-lit spaces, which was, of course, terribly attractive to them and to us as part of that inflow. Mm -hmm. uh, Soho was... Uh, uh, an area that clearly had a future, and it was in this case an artistic future. The galleries in West Broadway were beginning to flourish, mm -hmm. uh, such that they be, seemed to have almost a monopoly on New York art life at a certain point. Uh, and the old funky shops and restaurants were being closed down, and the rents were growing up slowly, but still easily. So this was a period of change and transformation that I found very interesting. Well, now it's like the world's largest shopping mall. I feel if I go out on a Saturday afternoon, I could be stampeded. Um, it, but, you know, this change was incremental. We, it didn't just happen. We knew it was happening. And um, if we were 
if, if we were the age we were 40 years ago, we would be moving somewhere in Brooklyn. We wouldn't be moving here. Um, and these things change. These things change. And in New York, it's all about real estate. And, and, um, but it was a kind of very special moment in the early 1970s uh, where we, we had a community. We could walk to everybody's place. Um, and everybody you were friendly with lived within a few blocks of one another. And uh, if I went out in the morning to get a carton of milk, I would have a conversation on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and and I th I'm really sad that uh, economics have changed such that young people moving to New York can't have this kind of experience that we had. How come you're still here, Joyce? <laughs> we have talked over the years of moving and where would we move, and you get comfortable. I mean, we have a, Max says to walk down the street is to live above his means. He's talking about these sort of glamorous designer shops that we, no one I know ever enters. Um, but we have a, a, a wonderful workspace, and there's really no reason to leave. Can you still afford to be here? And why? Um, yes, we can still afford to be here. And I know this has not been the case for many other people. But this building has been, this is one of the last all artist buildings. And we have kept our maintenance down um, we've really, really worked at keeping our maintenance down and most of us own shares in the stores on the ground floor from which we get income because rents and ground floor spaces, spaces in Soho are astronomical. Mm -hmm. So actually our living expenses are quite low. When we came here we were able to buy this loft with its representative shares in the building itself amongst the other holders. And who was responsible for organizing this building? Who was responsible for a man named George McCunis, a Fluxus artist mm -hmm. and real estate operator. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and may I ask you, how much did you pay for this loft? All right. Uh, when we were told a dollar price, it seemed way above our means. The sum was, according to Joyce, $45,000 for this space, mm -hmm. about 3,200 square feet. Wow. Uh, but suddenly, I mean, and curiously, I, re I recall that we might have a particular resource to handle this transfer of our lives and our work and our art. Namely, I owned a painting I bought as a young critic. The painting was by Agnes Martin, an abstract grid painting. I loved it, uh, but I thought it might serve as a sacrifice to starting up a new era in our life. So I was able to sell it for almost the sum. Same amount. Hmm? 45,000. Uh, of the of the payment that was required to buy, the, to buy this space. So Agnes Martin deserves a special place in our affections. Terrific. <laughs> okay. The, the neighborhood has changed a great deal. Max. Yes. And um, what do you think of that? Uh, in one sense, retail change, which is what you're talking about. Right is endemic in a big city like this, which is dynamic and hypercharged. And with the volatile rental schemes and the influx of different consumers, Soho retained only its old historic uh, architectural cast of the ironclad buildings from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. It was possible to walk down Broadway, walking south from Houston, and see a faded sign on one of the buildings nearby, Matthew Brady, photographer. Matthew Brady, Civil War photographer. Mm -hmm. really? So we had an idea of the historic past of the city as represented by 
that patch of Broadway, which was in the 19th century, the major shopping center of North America. On Broadway. Yeah, on Broadway. And it's still, it's now becoming again then. Right. Yes. Despite the fact that I am a professional art critic, people have told me I write well, which is a compliment. Mm -hmm. I also do color photography in the pre-digital state called analog, color negative. Mm -hmm. So I continued writing and became the executive editor of Art Forum, my home magazine, in 1975 and six. And so people know me as an editor and as a writer, less so as a photographer until more recently. And what was your photograph, what, what is your photography like? What was it like? I could be called a, a street photographer, someone who wanders through the streets, fishing, not, not shooting, fishing, waiting, loitering, looking for what I call subsequently the music of faces. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> I, pho I photographed mostly mo moments of spectacle and festive events mm -hmm. because of the sheer richness of the, the constituents. And uh, did you photograph Soho? And, uh, did, and what did you find interesting of Soho? Soho, our home area, was convenient for walking around. I didn't find it as picturesque as, for example, the West Indian Parade on Labor Day in Brooklyn and Eastern Parkway, mm -hmm. but I tried to make Soho look a little bit unbecoming and at the same time <laughs> <laughs> wonderful and unfamiliar, uh -huh. which was a task. Uh -huh. There was Incidentally, an exhibition at a gallery that became synonymous with Soho art trade, the Ivan Karp O.K. Harris Gallery. Ivan had a show there which directly referred to Soho. It was called the Treasures of the Sohoites, as if we were an ancient extinct race. <laughs> and I remembered twisted snap top from Coke bottles and Pepsi cans, you know as part of the uh, artifacts of a, a bygone golden age. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a bit about Ivan? Yes. Ivan, of course, was an, uh, an Upper East Side character at the, he, the Leo Costelli Gallery. He was the director of the gallery and a cigar-smoking, well-founded, affable master of ceremonies of the avant-garde. Uh -huh. He smoked cigars to extreme so that it was a little polluted to be around him. But he was a very funny fellow and very brazen and uh, rather a man of many parts, cultured and individualistic. When he moved down here, he became like the, the capital center of Soho art scene before 420 West Broadway across the street became uh, the, the rising paramount star. So. Soho was, in a sense, represented by this loudmouth, entrepreneurial, and uh, sweet-talking character uh, who formed a circle of his own and who established himself as the senior resident in the art trade. We liked him. The early galleries I remember down here are were Paula Cooper across the street from me, and Artist Space was above Paula Cooper, right. or adjacent and above Paula Cooper. And that was very interesting because there were shows that were artists curated, and artists would choose other artists. And uh, there were a lot of interesting shows at, at Artist Space. And then there was O.K. Harris on West Broadway, and AIR up the block on the other end of Worcester Street. At Worcester just be before you got to Spring Street. The AIR was organized by a group of women who couldn't get galleries, who were great, and that the women were just not being shown. And so they, they formed this gallery, which everybody paid attention to. Mm -hmm. And who was in that gallery? And uh, uh, it, it, was, it uh, was it militant? Was it, was it, were they like it was just a really good gallery. I mean, uh, some of the original members, Barbara Zucker was the driving force, 
and uh, Nancy Spiro was in it, and uh, uh, Anna Mendieta was in it. Um, uh, <laughs> if you had something special to say about Soho, what would it be? Soho, as we came to know it and became familiar with it, is an enclave uh, in which a number of individualists decided that this was a suitable work area for them to disseminate their work and get it uh, uh, distributed through the fledgling gallery scene that grew up um, uh, as we became more habituated citizens of the zone. Uh, its manufacturing identity gradually faded away and its notion of itself as, a, as an art producing center came to the fore. Of course, that was a very provincial idea uh, that the, the natives of Soho like to promote mm -hmm. uh, for the rest of the world to take notice. And so we were, in a sense, uh, as Chelsea is now, a place where people came to look at the newest and latest in contemporary American art. It was a substitute for the downtown 10th Street scene of the earlier abstract expressionists, but it wasn't a substitute for very long. It became the new center. Mm -hmm. uh, that is to say, as long as it was economically viable for the artists to stay here. Mm -hmm. I think the meaning of Soho was transferred according to various outsider notions and eventually even some of its internal agents became alienated by Soho. I remember my partner and boss at Artform, John Copeland's, sounding off quite often to say that it can't be that the whole center and destiny of Western art is located in one block on West Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to disseminate and to distribute art commentary in various cities as well as Europe, of course. The affection, somewhat, somewhat corrupted, that we feel towards New York and Soho was aptly represented by a remark attributed to the poet John Ashbery. Ashbery said, after living in New York, one can't be happy living anywhere else even in New York. <laughs> Do you still have a soft spot in your heart for Saha? I guess so. I guess so. To the extent that I've walked its streets and feel somehow elicited by its topography and by its potentials, yes, I'm infected by it and I'm domiciled by it, but I don't feel tremendously uh, involved in Soho. And I don't know most of the people. And the faces that I used to know are no longer present. There's one story that I think illustrates beautifully the sociology of Soho. Joyce mentioned that we had these friends, Paul and Miriam, who were older artists, and we hobnobbed and buddied with them. One night we went to a local restaurant on Prince Street. It had formerly been called E.H. Cast, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Now it was called W.P.A. In other words, a kind of a rather ironic reference to the work program of the artists in the 1930s during the Depression. Now we were settled down, ordering our meal and our wine, and the sommelier came over 
asking us what wine we desired, and Paul mentioned a wine. The sommelier raised his nose, uttered a dismissive remark, and said that that was a no good wine, and we were amateurs. Paul <laughs> took offense at this and said, my good sir, you don't recall that it was only with the influx of artists into this area that the carriage trade became a reality and created restaurants like yours. There's no reason for you to have sniffishness in hauteur. Be gone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay. 